Steve Austin uh, from the Institute for Creation Research has a, a, a detailed theory of coal formation in which uh, global worldwide flood produced these floating mats of vegetation and these floating mats of, mats of vegetation became coal. Uh, I'm not uh, a good enough geologist to know whether I agree with it or not um, but you know the one thing that's nice about it is it does it does tend to uh, um, um, support the observation that you can't find a lot of uh, standing roots in coal. You really would expect to find, if, if coal formed the way standard geology says, we would expect to find a lot of evidence of, of standing roots, you know, trees upright, you know, uh, and the roots forming the bush below the trees. Austin's uh, uh, theory gets around that because now the trees are upended and floating in the mats so you're not gonna have roots all over the place. So that's a nice thing, but I'm honestly not a good enough geologist to know whether it's a reasonable view or not. So, go, go ahead. What about the creation of fossils through uh, groundwater mineral deposition? Um, there are a lot, the question is about how, uh, how fossils are created and through groundwater deposition and so forth. The issue of fossil formation is very, in my mind, very difficult if you believe in an old earth. Uh, because, you know, living things tend to decompose. And if we're assuming, other than things like the La Brea tar pits and so forth, if we're assuming, you know, the, the, the fish is, you know, swimming along, has a heart attack, dies, falls on the, falls on the bottom of the seafloor, it's going gonna, it's gonna to decompose. It's never going to be fossilized. You have to have very specific conditions for fossilizations. Things like rapid burial and things like that tend to produce uh, fossilization much easier. And, and you know, of course, we have some fossils that indicate that. You have fossils of fish in the middle of dinner. You know, one, uh, one fish in the mouth of another fish. It's like they fossilize just like a moment in time almost. Uh, so if, if you're saying the groundwater is laden with minerals that increases the rate of fossilization, that's certainly possible. Uh, you know, I have pictures in one of my, one of my, uh, in my seventh grade book, for example, of a hat that's fossilized uh, and of a water wheel that's fossilized because it's been exposed to a high, to a, a, a water with high mineral content. And as a result, only, after only a few years, the water wheel and the hat got fossilized. So under the right conditions, we can form these fossils pretty quickly. I would think overall, though, most groundwater is full enough of decomposing bacteria that you're not going to get a lot of fossil formation through normal groundwater flow because it's just full of enough decomposers that it ought to just decompose the, the organism. But once again, I'm not a geologist, so that might be just a little bit, I might be stepping a little beyond my comfort zone there. <laughs> yes, ma'am. When they tried to date, for instance, the Shroud of Turkey, mm -hmm. and you said they can't date non-living things, are they dating? Yeah, uh, when they dated the Shroud of Turin. Interestingly enough, this is a little known fact, the Nuclear Structure Research Lab that used to be a part of the University of Rochester, the fellow who was in charge of that, his name's Harry Gove, he developed the process that was used to date the Shroud of Turin. Uh, it's called Tandem Accelerator Mass Spectrometry, and he was the one that developed it. Because prior to that, the way you did carbon-14 dating is you took this big thing and you burned it. <laughs> And you made this big, well, they didn't want that to happen to the shroud. <laughs> so in the end, you couldn't carbon date the shroud. Uh, but tandem accelerator mass spectrometer uses only about a milligram of substance to do the dating. So in the end, they let them date fibers that had fallen from the shroud and collected in the bottom of the casing. All right, but that was developed here. But your question is, what were they dating? They were dating the trees, you know, that were the plants that were used to make the fibers. So the ar argument is, if the shroud, and the shroud carbon dated to something like uh, 1300 AD, right, which means the plants died then. If the plants died then, they obviously weren't part of a shroud, uh, you know, during Christ's, uh, during Christ's burial. Uh, so that's, and, and you know, when that was being done, I was actually a grad student while that whole thing was being done, and Dr. Gove was going to the Vatican to speak to the Pope to get permission to do all of this. You know, I told people back then that it's not real long before the dating occurred because if you believe scripture, scripture says the shroud was wrapped around Christ. And that's a very specific word, wrapped. In order to get the image, the shroud would have been laid over Christ. So if you believe the scripture, you shouldn't believe that's the shroud. But yeah, that, they were dating the plants. Good question. Yes, sir. Couldn't you, could you uh, date the earth by using like nat natural resources like the ocean or mountains? 
Well, you, can you date the Earth using things like the ocean and the mountains? You can, for example, people have tried to suggest how old the Earth is by the erosion rates. So the mountains, you know, mountains are continually being uplifted, but at the same time eroding. And some people say they've been, uh, they're eroding much faster than they're uplifting, so the Earth ought to be out of flat if it's very old. Those days, that's very tough because we barely understand uh, mount, we, I would say we don't understand mountain formation. We don't understand these processes that are causing the uplift to begin with. As far as we're, you know, if we understood these, we could predict earthquakes and we can't, <laughs> you know. So in the end, I think our understanding of all those processes is so rudimentary that it would be hard to use that as a dating technique. You, you want to study things that either you've studied for a long time or you know pretty well. Those are things that will lead to better assumptions. Yes, ma'am. Oh, yeah, that's a great question. Uh, if, we're, if the Earth is old, how can we see light from, uh, from galaxies that are hundreds of, billion, uh, hundreds of millions of light years away? How can, actually, hundreds of billions of light years away. You know, I never considered that a very, uh, uh, a very reasonable uh, argument because the one thing we know is as soon as we step out of our little corner of the universe and start getting around things like black holes and big galaxies, Time doesn't behave nicely anymore. When I get near a black hole, time slows down compared to folks far away. So we know that out in the universe, clocks are ticking at lots of different rates. You know? And to assume that somehow our clock is the universal standard doesn't make a lot of sense. Now, what I will say is that something that most people who believe in the Big Bang and believe that the, that the, Earth is, or that the universe is 15 billion years old won't tell you is that in the Big Bang, the, the universe starts out tiny, right? And it's expanding. Now, we always do this when it's expanding. That's not the way the Big Bang says the universe is expanding. The universe isn't expanding with a center or an edge in the Big Bang. Space itself is expanding. It's expanding in all directions with no geometry. But in any event, it's supposed to be about 15 to 20 billion years old according to the dating techniques. Therefore, how big should the universe be if it's 20 billion years old and it started off pretty small? I would think at most, 20 billion light years. However, the universe is at least 150 or 170 billion uh, light years across. At least. Now, how can that be? If it's starting off small and expanding, how can it be bigger than the age? Because in the end, if it's truly 170 billion years, light years old and it's been expanding, it had to have been expanding faster than the speed of light. All right. If it's been expanding faster than the speed of light, that, that contradicts special relativity. Now, special relativity has no problem with light traveling faster than it is now. That's not a problem for special relativity. It's a real problem for something with mass to travel faster than the speed of light. So if anything, to me, the Big Bang has the bigger problem. Because the Big Bang's contradicting special relativity. It forces the universe to expand faster than the speed of light. This is during the inflationary period of the universe. That's a bigger problem to me than how we can see light, year from, uh, light from far away. However, the problem we always hear about is seeing light from far away. Not the fact that any universal expansion, given the time frames given, uh, you know, defy special relativity. So in any event, we know clocks uh, run differently. There are basically two ways people think about this. One is that perhaps the speed of light was faster in the past. Is there reason to believe this? Well, most astrophysicists, most cosmologists who believe in the Big Bang definitely want the speed of light to be infinite in the past. Paul Davies did a study not all that long ago where he saw, and Paul Davies is a uh, you know, Big Bang astronomer, um, he did a study where he tried to show that the fine structure constant has changed in the past. That would change the speed of light. He did that because he specifically says he needs the speed of light to be infinite in order to allow for equilibrium during the inflationary period of the universe. So in the end, most folks who are working with the Big Bang want the speed of light to be infinite, or at least very fast in the past. If that were the case, then we don't have a problem. I actually don't like that scenario very well. There's a fellow by the name of Humphreys who wrote a book called Starlight and Time that has a cosmology based on geometry 
uh, cosmology where the universe is expanding with a center and an edge. This is different from the Big Bang where that doesn't happen. Given the center and the edge, he shows that clocks on the edge of the universe run incredibly slowly compared to clocks on the center, in the center. So if we're near the center of the universe, we would expect to see things from far away because the clock here is running, you know, is running very slowly whereas the clocks out there are running very quickly. So in the end, what's